Today I'd like to talk to you about the C word. It's a word that over 14 million people worldwide hear annually, and it's the cause of death over, of over 8 million people each year. The C word to which I'm referring to is cancer, and it's a devastating disease and diagnosis for anyone. Now, cancer does not discriminate. It affects the young, the old, the rich, the poor, friends and families. You can clearly see this, as I have, in the waiting room of Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. This is a hospital that's larger than a city block and is completely devoted to treat, treating and caring cancer patients. Now, through my family's journey with cancer, we have learned that the disease will spread through cells that have shed from the primary tumor and enter into the bloodstream. Some cells, unfortunately, will bind to a distant organ, thereby producing new tumors, new metastases, and complicating the disease for the patient. Given this, I've often wondered, why can't there be a simple blood test that can detect these rogue cells in, in the blood of a patient? And could this be used as a liquid biopsy, perhaps replacing or supporting invasive biopsies that are traditionally used today? Now, Given this, unfortunately, this is a needle in a haystack problem, as there are only one to 10 cells in a single draw of blood that already contains billions of other cells. If we were successful, however, we would be able to monitor a, a cancer patient's cancer more uh, rapidly. And in addition, we would also be able to molecularly characterize these cells. Now, this may seem like an impossible task, but in fact, it really isn't. We just need to remember that it wasn't too long ago where we thought that sequencing the human genome was impossible. And yet today, we're able to sequence anyone's genome for less than $1,000. So by pushing the boundaries, we're able to achieve the impossible. What are some of the approaches that one can use to isolate these cancer cells? Well, simple filtration is one idea because these cells are much larger than red blood cells and larger than the majority of white blood cells. Unfortunately, we found that these cells stick to the filters. They also get damaged during the process. Impurity is an issue. Another possibility is to use antibodies that attach themselves and identify specific surface markers on the surface of cells, as you've heard from Amy. Now, this is great, but unfortunately, some of these cells do get changed during the process, and you lo do lose some of the cells during preparation. More importantly, just as our fingerprints are all unique to ourselves, so too are our cancers. As well, down to the single cell level in tumors, those cells are also unique and they, can, um, they, they might not share the same um, surface markers, thereby complicating the, our challenge further. At UC Berkeley, we're creating microflute platforms that can take the blood of a patient, isolate the cancer cells, and detect specific surface markers and identify them. The way we do this is we use basic physics principles. The very first principle that we use is inertial force. This is the force that you feel as you go around a roller coaster at very high speeds. It's the force that keeps you in your seat. It's the force that keeps the roller coaster on that track. If we didn't have inertial force, the consequences would be obviously very devastating. Now, at the same time, at the microfluidic range, if we employ inertial forces, we can actually use it to separate cells based upon size. We can separate out the red blood cells, platelets, and we can also separate the white blood cells and the cancer cells themselves. The cells naturally just separate from one another. They're not damaged during the process, and we can isolate them and further examine them downstream. Now, the way we do that is we use velocity. What we do is we have a microfluidic channel. It's coated with all different antibodies, and the surface markers on the surface of the cell some of them may recognize a particular antibody and will slow down. Others will just pass through very quickly. And this way, we're able to identify these markers. Our entire microfluid platform is low cost, and it also sits on top of a PC board that's very compact. And that allows a doctor to use this technology in his office. This means that a patient wouldn't have to travel very far to a distant hospital, to a, a, a lab, in order to monitor the, his or her cancer. Of course, with any new technology, there are barriers to adoption. These barriers could include costs, and they could also include uh, regulatory issues. I would argue that another barrier is actually the medical community itself, doctors who are very conservative and not open to using new breakthrough technologies or try them out. 
Now, there is reason. Obviously, with any new technology, you need to extensively prove it and to test it and validate it. But even so, I would argue that we still need a community of people to actually light this fire of adoption of breakthrough technologies within the medical community. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to say that every cancer patient is different. Yet, they all share, and I think we as a community all share the same desire. We would like a technology that can allow us to monitor cancer more quickly and often. And furthermore, we'd like to have a technology that can actually, in the end, detect these unique differences in cells. I finally pose these two questions. What are the pieces of, of the puzzle that will enable a faster adoption of the cancer? And in addition, who are the players that will help us encourage the adoption of new technologies by the medical community? Thank you.